I wonder if we are getting the picture of the seriousness of what our Lord Jesus has been talking about here as he's been walking us up the spiritual mount. Mount of Beatitudes, Mount of the Sermon on the Mount. Seriousness of where he's leading. He's talking about life and death situation here. About decisions that people are going to make. Choices that people are going to make concerning their eternal destiny. I had a friend at one time that I was sharing the gospel with. And uh, he was always coming back at me. Richie, don't take life so seriously. Life's not to be that serious. And this guy's an unbeliever still to this day. He's still as lost as he ever was. But he obviously understood that I was taking life seriously, and I think we should take life seriously. I think we should take every moment that we have here seriously. And I think that we should take every moment that we have in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even as Scott was praying this morning about a friend that, uh, that he had been sharing with, and probably many that you have been sharing with here. We have to continue to share and proclaim and pray for those friends and family and and, and all that are uh, people we work with, go to school with, that are lost. And what Jesus is talking about here is life and death. Eternal life, eternal death. Throughout the sermon, Jesus has been coming back to an underlying theme. There is no room in the kingdom of heaven for the hypocritical, self-righteous, religious person. He stated early on in verse 20 of chapter 5 to his disciples, or to those that he was, he was talking to, the group of men that he had chosen, and he said to them, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will in no wise enter or even see the kingdom of heaven. Now, this had to have been a blow to the people that he was talking to. Certainly, he couldn't have been talking about Rabbi so-and-so. Why, he's one of the most religious people that we know. And the scribes and the Pharisees of Jesus' day had set themselves up as the standards of righteousness by which everyone else would be compared. But here Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is saying, uh-uh, no, no. They are not God's standard for comparison. And to compare oneself to them is to compare yourself to a false standard that will lead to self-deception, that will lead through the broad way that leads to destruction. Let me just warn you and say to you, let not your standard of comparison be any man. Don't let your standard of comparison be any pastor. Don't let your standard of comparison be any teacher. Your standard must be Jesus Christ. He is God's standard of righteousness. So here in closing, Jesus is challenging those who are listening to his message. If you want to go to heaven, there is one way, and it's through the narrow gate. But be careful. Beware. Beware because not only will men, false prophets, false teachers dangerously and deceptively lead men astray because the heart of man is deceitful and basically wicked, desperately wicked. And man can be self-deceived in believing what he wants to hear, believing a lie rather than t to receive the love of the truth and be saved, as Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 through 11. And all through his ministry here, Jesus warns, take heed. All through his ministry, take heed not only what you hear, the doctrine that's being taught. Take heed what you hear, but he will also say, take heed to how you hear it. 
What kind of heart is hearing what is being preached? Thanks, Greg. Because obviously this is going to affect one's eternal destiny. False prophets and false teachers are out there. And they're out there with an agenda. They, you know, might be thought of as the politically correct of the day. They're very accommodating. They're very appealing. Their agenda does not challenge one to a life of holiness, does not challenge one to a life of obedience to the Word and the will of God. Their message does not point to a Savior. There's no need for a Savior in many of these messages. Therefore, there's no need for a changed life. There's no hope of salvation, though. You might have heard it said in a popular song, a popular Christian song, a few years ago. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Well, here at the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is saying that this is exactly what it's going to take if one is going to get into heaven. Dying. The point is not necessarily physical dying, although there will be those that pass through those doors who are going to heaven. But really what the point is there is what the scripture would call dying to oneself, to self-will, self-righteousness, self-sufficiency, self-glorying. Something that Jesus would continue to teach about through his earth, earthly ministry. If any man comes unto me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. You know, we need to be reminded daily. I need to be reminded daily. Because how quickly we forget. And he is making this warning very clear why. Why? Because of what we read today in verse 21 of Matthew chapter 7. Because not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And this is the word of the Lord for us this morning. Father, I pray in all humility, Lord, that we would hear what the Spirit would say today. And Lord, that we would hear it in all humility, each one of us, Lord, you tell us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so as, Lord, I, God, want to be a vessel that you can use today, Lord. I know that even as the words are spoken out today, Lord, it's not a pointing of the finger at anyone who is seated here today, Lord. But my heart is included in what we share today. Give us all ears to hear what the Spirit would say. In all humility, we ask this in Jesus' name. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone, meaning that some will. Some will. But not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone is going to get into heaven because they go to church. Not everyone is going to get into heaven because they think they belong there. I had a person that I was sharing with, you know. I asked him, you know, do you want to go to heaven? Yeah. Well, how are you going to get there? Why are you going to get there? Well, because I want to be there. Well, <laughs> great. <laughs> but there's one way. And not everyone that wants to be there may in fact be there. Because it's not because one is simply a good person that they're going to be there. Not everyone's going to get to heaven because they said the sinner's prayer and walked forward at a Billy Graham crusade. 
Not everyone's going to get to heaven because they were baptized in water. Not everyone. And for many people sitting in church pews all across America and around the world today, these verses, when they are read, when one reads these verses in the Sermon on the Mount here, better be a wake-up call, or else for some it's going to be a rude awakening, a terrifying, frightening, eternal, rude awakening with no chance to turn back. Do you know that almost half of the adults in America in a survey done by George Barna report that they're born again Christians and that they're heaven bound. Almost half, 43%, that's somewhere between 4 and 5 out of 10 people believe that they're on their way to heaven. That's quite interesting to me. Could it possibly be that high? How many are actually sitting in the pews across America today who really don't have a clue or don't know what the criteria for going to heaven is or from on what they will base even why they would be going there? They're basing it on a church denomination. And many church denominations never open their Bibles. Do you know that? Many church denominations around this country never open their Bibles and they never talk about Jesus. They never talk about sin. They never talk about the cross. They never talk about these things. Many are basing the fact that they're going to heaven on church ordinances. Well, we practice two church ordinances here at Calvary Chapel. Baptizing those who have repented and make that outward proclamation of the inward work that Christ has done in their life, and also the Lord's table. But many believe that because of they have gone through church ordinances, which are no more than rituals in their life. They went through some ritual of tradition. They're going to heaven. And many also believe that they're going there because of good works. They're just a good person. I had another friend years ago, right after I came to the Lord, a Jewish friend, still consider him a friend, don't see him too much, talk to him that much anymore. But I remember uh, when I uh, became a believer, I shared with him my faith. Fact is, uh, he was the editor of a, of a, of a well-known um, music magazine at the time, and uh, he had asked me to write an article on what it meant, you know, in my life, uh, you know, to, to turn 30. And uh, it was very interesting because uh, a lot of changes happened in my life, you know, about that time. Because I became a believer, and he didn't know that. When I turned the paper into him, he, he called me back on the phone a meeting and said, I can't print this in my, in my magazine. He says, if I print this in my magazine, it'll, it'll destroy your career right now. And I said, this is who I am. This is what it means to me to have, changed, to have you know, made that transition in my life and turned 30. This is what you have to print. And so he went ahead and printed it. But along the way, you know, we continued to have um, uh, conversations uh, about God and about salvation. And he was certain that because he was a good person, and he was, if there can be such a thing, because Jesus said, you know, to the rich guy that came to him and called him uh, a, good, a good man, he said, why do you call me good? There's only one that's good, and that's God. But, I mean, in, in all... You know, from man's standpoint, he was a good person. He was, he was a good friend. He was a good person. And uh, he thought that, you know, God would excuse anything else going on in his life and, you know, open the door wide to heaven simply because he was a good person. And many today are basing, you know, the fact that they'll be in heaven because of the church denomination that they belong to, the church rituals that they've gone through, or the fact that they're a good, a good person. And many are confident that they're going to be a shoe in but are they? Will they? Now, I don't want to cause worry to you this morning. And I don't want to cause anxiety. And I don't want you to get angry with me. And I don't want you to get frustrated. And I don't want you to, you know, to, to think that, uh, you know, there's cast, the casting of doubt upon any one specific life here. Because what Jesus is teaching here is that to give us confidence and to give us assurance to those who do believe 
of the hope that is within them of everlasting life. And he wants the believer to have this hope. Jot down John chapter 5, verse 24. I'll just give you two. There's, there's a few. 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 through 13. God wants us to have the assurance of our salvation. But all along in his message, he is making it clear by the contrast that he has made between the religious people of his day and the ones that he is talking to that not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. That there is a difference between those who will be citizens of his kingdom and those who simply think they will be. But who have in fact made only a false profession of faith. Jesus is putting it very clearly here in black and white. The good news doesn't have room for speculation, and also it's more than lip service. J.C. Ryle, not to be confused with another known as James, writes, The Lord winds up the Sermon on the Mount by a passage of heart-piercing application. And maybe there will be some toes that are stepped on in the course of the message today. But he says that Jesus winds up the Sermon on the Mount by a passage of heart-piercing application. He turns now from false prophets to false professors. From unsound teachers to unsound hearers. And that's the end of his quote. You know, I've noticed since I have been a pastor that one of the things that many churchgoers, and maybe I'll even call them professing Christians, one of the things that they're offended at is to be challenged to self-examination, to take a good, hard look at our own hearts in our own life, to see whether or not we are of the faith. Because underneath it all, and behind it all, God sees how it really looks. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 5, to examine yourselves to see if you're, if you're of the faith. Prove, he says, yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you be qualified? Now, there's probably not a person here this morning that doesn't want to go to heaven or maybe believe you're going to heaven. And and when I say professing Christians, I want to make make something, you know, I want to make the, the, I guess, the distinction there. There's a distinction between a professing Christian and a confessing believer. There's a difference. The professing Christian is one that basically, without elaborating, has made lip service. And they go through all of the rituals. They go to church religiously. um, uh, They've gone through the, um, uh, the, the, the church rituals. Um, but their life and their lifestyle gives nothing to back up that there was ever a change, that they were ever really born again. And what has happened, they've basically given lip service. God prophesied through Isaiah concerning the children, many of the children of Israel, that these people draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts far from me. And that's the difference between a professing Christian and a confessing believer, one who has made a confession of faith. And basically, you know, the one who is a professing Christian, he gets offended when you come and you say, hey, take a look inside, you know, see what's going on. But I'll tell you what, a true believer isn't going to have a problem with self-examination. In fact, they're going to welcome it, even as the psalmist said in Psalm 139, search me, O God. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of righteousness. I want to know. I want to know if I'm excusing something in my life that is offensive to God. 
I'll talk about excusing things in my life and in your life and in you know, our lives here in just a minute. Because it can be a very dangerous thing to do. But tragically, there are many that are comfortably sitting in churches all across America today. A lot of folks. Who may be in for a big surprise when they cross that line into eternity. God, I don't want to do anything to misrepresent you. I don't want to do anything to offend you. Now, that's the kind of heart that, a, that God can work with. Jesus said in a similar sermon in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Why do you call me Lord? And you don't do the things that I say. Why do you call me Lord? And you don't do the things that I say. It's amazing the folks, the things that folks can do. The things that they know are outright disobedient to the word of God. I mean those that you look at and think they were mature believers. Excusing things as if no one's looking in their life. John MacArthur writes in his commentary, sinful man is biased in his own favor. It's true. <laughs> sinful man is biased in his own favor. And it's amazing the things that we know are outright offensive to God that are condemned that we would condemn in others but have somehow found ways to allow them to be excused in our own lives or those in the close proximity of our relationships. I've had believers come to me, and I've, I'm talking about those that you would consider to be mature, Bible-believing Christians who know what the Bible says about a man and a woman living together as a husband and wife outside of marriage, passing themselves off as a family. That the Bible would condemn that and call that sin. And they would condemn it in anyone else's life also as the Bible does. But the minute it was a family member, they found all the excuses in the world that you could imagine. Well, it's common law marriage. You know, they're, they're married in God's eyes. And where where, where does it say in the Bible that we've got to have a public ceremony? And on and on and on and on and on and on. And yet they know, they know what the Bible says about a man and a woman living together outside of that public declaration. There are Christians who know that doing certain things, doing drugs, smoking marijuana is sin, and yet... More believers than you'd probably like to know have excused it in their lives. We know what the Bible says about gossiping and about backbiting. If we don't, listen to what Proverbs 26, 20 says. Where there is no wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no tail bear, strife ceases. <laughs> and yet... We backbite against brothers and sisters. We have an unforgiving spirit towards brothers and sisters. And the list goes on. You want to read the list? In Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, the list is pretty extensive. Paul calls them the works of the flesh. And he says, you know what? They're very evident. Adultery. Sexual relationship. Outside of marriage. Fornication. Premarital. Sexual relationships. Uncleanness. Licentiousness. It's just living a foul life. Idolatry, holding something up in place of God. Sorcery, the word in the Greek is pharmakia, drugs. Hatred, 
contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you before. Now, this is the scary part. Because, you know, we can think about the adultery, the fornication, and, and thus and so. But, boy, when it gets down to the hatred and contentions and jealousies, wow, didn't know that they fit in the same little realm as all of these big, major sins, you know. But Paul says... I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. He says the first thing, and same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. And he goes on to list basically the same, the same list there. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetousness, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. They will not, he says, inherit the kingdom of God. And what he is telling us here are those who habitually, deliberately, and continually practice these things, whose habit of life excuses these things in their life. Tell you what, they got something to worry about. They got something to worry about. I have something to worry about. You have something to worry about. I may not be an adulterer. I may not be a fornicator, but I can find some things in here that get a little close to home. Things that have been mentioned here. Now, I'm not here to judge you. I'm not here to pass judgment on you. But don't bring me... <laughs> Don't bring me up at the judgment and say, I was never told. <laughs> no one ever told me. Well, even as Paul says and as Jesus warns, we need to check out our own hearts. Because it's not just how good we look on the outside. It's not just by saying the right things. It's not just by going to the right church. It's not by just doing the right things. But where's the heart in it all? That's what God wants to know. Where's the heart? Because God's looking at the heart. And not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Now it's true that no one will enter the kingdom of heaven who does not confess Jesus Christ as Lord. But let me just tell you, Lord, Lord is not some little magic words that, you know, that, that, that we can just say and, and think that, you know, everything else is excused if the heart isn't right. Because as Jesus says here, they will fall on deaf and offended ears in heaven. The word Lord means to be ruled by and controlled by. It's a word of surrender. It's more than just a word of human respect. And when it's emphasized, Lord, Lord, it's really speaking of one to whom devotion and one to whom a life is dedicated to in willful obedience. To call him Lord and not be obedient to his word and to his will is to violate the third commandment in the law, which says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. And this is it. Willful submission and obedience and a heart that God is working in. A heart that God is molding and shaping and conforming into the image of His Son. Then it's a heart that He can work in. Otherwise, the lingo doesn't mean anything. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now, this is interesting, because here also a lot of people go astray, and they just think if they do, you know, good things for people, that's enough. That's all God's looking at. If I just do good things, go out of my way, bend over backwards... To do good things for people. That's all that's necessary. 
to enter into the kingdom of heaven. God won't turn me away. I'm a good person. And you know what? We talked about this last week. The world has embraced this idea as a convenient substitute for a life surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ and the work of the cross. If I just do good things, that's over here contrasted, in essence, with the work of Jesus Christ at the cross and the price that he paid and the sacrifice that he made for sinful man that we might be saved. Right and honorable humanitarian efforts and works are not sufficient in and of themselves to guarantee and assure one the entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Chapter 3, verse 5 of his epistle, that it is not by works of righteousness which we have done. Not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. How? Through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. It's his work. It's his blood. And there's our faith to believe that. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 tells us, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works. So very clearly, you know, it's not by works that we are saved. Now we'll talk about that in just a minute. But it's through faith. It's by grace through faith that we're saved. What is the will of the Father in this whole idea of salvation? Believe and trust in the work of Jesus Christ, Calvary Cross, for the work that He came and to take away the sin of the world. Believe that all work necessary is his work. And then in obedience. Walk off. The talk. You know, Richie went to I can't just always fall short. Always messing up. You know what? If you know that, they're gonna do something about that. And there's a difference with that put note that they I want to be shot. I don't want to you. I don't want to represent you. I have to live a life that's pleasing to you before you and before my fellow man. I can look in your life because knows how frail you are. Knows how frail I am. No, I'm going to sin. Lose it. That person who's can and God can work life. You know, though, there are others that even thought to it at all. And one about skewing sin in their life. Would will another to believe what the Bible says about only about sin? Jesus Christ. And obey his word in will obedience. This is Testament and New Testament alike. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 20 through 28, Moses tells the children of Israel, Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you obey. The curse if you do not obey. So there's the blessing if we obey God's word. There's the curse if we refuse to obey God's word. Jesus said in chapter 8 of John's gospel, verses 31 through 32, he said, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Conditional? You see that if, that little two letters, I-F, if. Conditional. You abide. If you abide in my word... If you settle down in my word, if you allow my word to penetrate and pierce your heart, if you allow the Holy Spirit to take my word and to make those changes of sanctification in your life, then you are my disciple indeed. If you will confess your sin, then he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Then you are my disciple indeed. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And you won't be holding the, the, this weight upon your shoulder, because you know. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, we read that he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So you see, there's something very serious about obeying the word of God here. He became, meaning Jesus Christ, speaking of Christ, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. 
Who is it that loves me? Jesus said in John chapter 14. Who is it that loves me? It's him who obeys my words. And then the Father will love him and we will come and make ourselves known to him. There's obedience. It's not I go off and do just my own will. But now if I call him Lord and Master, I've surrendered to him. And he becomes the Lord of my life. And he's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Bottom line. Am I excusing things in my life? Are you excusing things in your life? Just little things. Not real big things. Just little things. Are we trying to do these good things in over here to balance out the bad things that we do over here? And oh, when it all washes out, it'll be okay. Now I want to tell you something. Works are important. And there's many scriptures to encourage works in the life of of the believer. But even as works without faith are meaningless, so James tells us in chapter 2, verse 26 of his epistle, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith also without works is dead. Works without faith are nothing. They're meaningless. But also faith without works is also dead. Earlier he wrote in chapter 1, verse 22 of his epistle, be doers of the word. So there's an active obedience in doing what the word says and not hearers only. Why? Deceiving yourselves. Self-deception. Paul writes, for not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Romans chapter 2 verse 13. There was a question asked to Jesus, what must I do to do the works of God? And Jesus said, believe in him who he sent. Believe in Him. Obedience to God's Word. Believe the Word. John chapter 6, verse 29. Believe what God says in the Bible about Jesus Christ. That's the bottom line. The works that glorify God, the proof in the pudding, is a life surrendered, a life of faithfulness to God. Willful obedience to his word. Notice verse 22. Jesus says, though, many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Haven't we done many wonders in your name? In verse 23, he says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You who practice lawlessness. Now this is really serious business. And this is why you and I cannot judge another person's heart. Because we will judge undoubtedly by the outward things that we see. And only God knows the heart of a person. Those who prophesy. Those who cast out demons. Those who did many miracles, he's saying. And notice after each one... In your name, in your name, in your name. Didn't we do all of these mighty works in your name? Didn't we do, didn't we do, didn't we do, didn't we do? And he said, yeah, you did. And that's about all it was. It was doo-doo. Isaiah would say it was his filthy rags. Unacceptable to God. Why? Because basically what he's saying, it was done with the wrong motives, with the wrong heart, and for the wrong reasons. And those works, no matter what they did, whether it was preaching, you know, we might think of prophecy today as the fourth telling of God's word, whether it's a preacher. Hey, James tells us in his epistle, don't be, let there not be many teachers among you because we're held in the higher accountability. We're also warned, if we're going to teach it, we better, and preach it, then we better live it. So don't think I'm excusing myself, you know, from the things that I'm sharing with you today. And if I do things to bring honor and glory to myself and not bring honor and glory to God, then it's just as offensive to Him as many other things. Casting out demons 
in your name, prophesying in your name, doing many wonderful miracles in your name, and then I will declare to them, I, ne I, I never knew you. All these great things done in his name, all to no avail. You know, it's interesting that many ministries today are being validated by these very things. The prophets. Ministries validated by the casting out of demons and the miracles. Now, I want to tell you that I'm not in any way uh, belittling these things. Because you know what our position here at Calvary Chapel is on the gifts of the Spirit. And we believe in all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and that they are active in believers' lives today. And still many will say to him in that day, didn't we do? And I will declare, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You're breaking the law. And it should cause us to be very cautious because many ministries are being validated by these very things today and how many miracles we hear coming out of this you know, sector and how many miracles out of here and the prophecies over here and over there and boy, man, we, wow, ooh, God must be really doing a major thing. Oh, wow, you know. And we need to just be careful about this. We need to be cautious about how we validate and how we evaluate ministries because I don't know the motives behind them. Some may be absolutely of God, but clearly, as Jesus says here, others aren't. But you want to know what the real issue is here? It's not about what they're doing over there. It's about what God's doing right here. That's what the real issue is. And we need to personalize this. Because God will take care of them just as sure as he'll take care of us. But we need to be sure of our own heart. Is our own heart right with God? The things that we do. Do they match up with a heart that's surrendered to him? Jesus doesn't want any confusion here. It's interesting. These are all very supernatural things. You, we might ask, you know, how could anyone other than a believer even do these things? Well, I want to tell you the scripture's full of other people than believers doing these things. Other than believers prophesying. Other than believers casting out demons. Other than believers working miracles. I remember a guy named Balaam. Remember a guy named Balaam in Numbers chapter 23? He was not a man of God. And yet he was a prophet. He was a false prophet. I remember Saul being called a prophet. I remember a guy named Caiaphas. In John chapter 11, verse 51, who prophesied of the Lord's death, and he certainly was not a believer. God permitted these men to prophesy and use them in spite of themselves. Satan also has power. His power is limited. But we can go clear back to Pharaoh's court when Moses was before Pharaoh's court, and we know that his magicians were able to do certain of these supernatural things, the same things that Moses was doing. They were limited, but they were able to do some things. I remember in Acts chapter 8, a fellow named Simon the sorcerer who did miracles and, and many wonders. I remember a couple of fellows <laughs> in Acts chapter 19, verses 13 and 14, known as Sceva's sons. You know, who cast out demons, and it's a pretty funny story. You might go back there and, and read about it. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, we're also told of the lying wonders of Satan through a man called the lawless one. The miracles, and signs and wonders. And so God has, you know, permitted it, prophesied, and, and different things to be done. Satan and his supernatural power, and I can maybe suggest, you know, an, another possibility, you know, to these so-called things that they did in his name. Maybe they never happened at all. How many, I mean, I can just think myself of, of times that where some of these quote-unquote miracles 
were done, validated, so to speak, in the name of Christ, you can throw your glasses away. You can see clearly now. And they throw their glasses away, and they walk out into the wall. You know, they miss the door because they weren't healed. But supposedly, they were healed. Maybe these things never happened at all. We hear of so many of these quote-unquote healing ministries. And the phoniness behind these ministries. There was a fellow a few years ago, you remember... Uh, he had this very popular, quote-unquote, healing ministry in America. And you remember he was exposed as he had this little thing in his ear, this little um, earphone, and, you know, his wife was in the back, and she was giving him the messages of people that she had talked to before the service. There's a guy sitting out there about midway down on the left-hand side. He's sitting in a bright Hawaiian shirt over there. And you know what? The guy, he's just had these terrible back problems, you know, and can barely walk. And honey, call him out. You know, oh, yeah, the Lord's put on my heart this guy over here. You know, word of knowledge, you know. And, ah. Uh, and I don't want to undermine the healing power of God today. But I want to tell you, we need to be careful how we validate these ministries because Jesus clearly says here that to many he will say, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Oh, he knew him all right. He knew him oh too well. And he knew the deceit in their heart, and he knew the lies that they chose to believe and the deception that they practiced. And I want to tell you something. He knows it on a big scale, And he knows it on a little scale. He knows it in these very public ministries. And he knows it in our very own hearts. He knows it. The wording here indicates those who continue such things. Who continue to practice such things. Without repentance. That's what it's all about. Because you see the Lord knows those who are his. In 2 Timothy chapter 2.19. Paul tells Timothy. The Lord knows those who are His. And He also knows how frail we are. He knows that we will fail. He knows that we will sin. He knows that we will fall short of the glory of God. And that's why He has given us the place of grace to come and to repent. Psalm 96 says, Today, today, if you will hear My voice and not harden your heart as in the day of provocation, then He can work. But you know what? When one chooses to excuse sin in their life, it may be just a little thing in your eyes. But when we begin to excuse sin in our life, what happens is that our heart starts to become hardened to it. And when our heart becomes hardened to it, the little sin becomes more. And we begin to excuse other things in our lives and we begin to justify those things and what I am doing certainly isn't one of these big things I didn't murder anyone it was my sin that put him on the cross it was your sin that put him on the cross how big does that sin have to be Is God doing it in increments? That's a big one. That's a little one. I'll excuse this one. Forgive this one. No. Sin is not excused, as we said last week. It's forgiven. And in order for it to be forgiven, it must be confessed and repented of. And then you know what? He can work. He taught us earlier in this prayer, or in this sermon, in chapter 6, verse 12, He taught us, forgive us our sins. Plural. Forgive us our debts, some say. Forgive us our trespasses, some say. Not just sin, the root, but the fruit. And that's something that I need to continuously go before the Lord. 
Otherwise, I stand in that place of excusing it and a hardening of my heart. And oh, God will forgive me. And he will forgive you. But John says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, there are a lot of people that don't like to deal with this. I was forgiven when I first became believed, and I don't have to ask forgiveness anymore. I call that pride. I call that pride. And I call that treading on some pretty strange water. (laughs) When God has given us the place of grace, the place of mercy to come, to seek his forgiveness. And this is what he's looking for in the life of the believer. Honestly, and he's looking for humility, honesty and humility. And then he can work. And you know what? Then you don't have really anything to worry about. If you have come to him and you've sought forgiveness for your sin that put him on the cross, and you believe that he died for you 2,000 years ago for your sin, that he has washed you clean with his blood, You're forgiven and you're going to heaven. But you know what? If you allow it to just go on in your life or allow sin, if you excuse it, then I'll tell you what, fellowship is broken with the Lord. Psalm 66 tells us, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And then we begin playing a game with God. When I stand before the Lord, I want to hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. This hasn't been easy to maybe say today for you and for me to examine our hearts, to see if we're of the faith, to prove ourselves, to see if indeed the Christ is in us. It's not easy to say, don't try to pull the wool over on anybody, especially yourself. We're not going to pull the wool over on God's eyes. We're the only ones that we are going to deceive. And so as believers, we need to take to heart what he's saying here. Because we know that only by the grace of God will any of us ever see the kingdom of heaven. One commentator wrote, Mere professed devotion to Christ is but another Judas kiss. Mere devotion. Or mere professed devotion is but another Judas kiss. God, may we be sincere in our love for you. May we be sincere in our devotion to you. Because we're not fooling anybody but ourselves. If we're not. Have you been fooling around with God? Have you been excusing things in your life? Letting things slide? Oh, they're not really big. Oh, how big did it have to be to put him on the cross? John writes in his first epistle, chapter 2, verse 28, Little children, abide in him, that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his presence. Abide in him that we're not ashamed before him at his presence. If I'm excusing things in my life, I'll tell you what, I'm going to be ashamed. I want to do all that I can in my life to humble myself before him, to allow him to work his perfect work in my life. I don't want to do anything to offend him, and I do. I do things to offend him. I say things to people I don't mean to say. I think thoughts that I don't mean to think. Sometimes I don't act very Christian-like. I apologize to you and I apologize to my Lord for it. But he can work when we do that. If we don't let it slide. I don't want to do anything, Lord, to offend you. I don't want to do anything to offend my brothers and sisters. God, I can't do it on my own. 
Amen to that? Father, thank you. For the challenges, Lord, that are very real today. And Father, the, the things that we say today, Lord, are things, Lord, that, again, not to cause us to doubt our salvation, not to put fear or fright of an un, uh, at least an ungodly fear. We should have a godly fear. It shouldn't cause us to get mad. But what should it do, Lord? It should have us to look deep within our own hearts to see that we are abiding in you and you in us, that our lives are bearing fruit which glorify you and more fruit and much fruit. Father, I pray for each one who is here today. I pray, Lord, that for believers today, if it's time now to deal with something in our lives, something that we have been excusing, God, I pray in all humility, Lord, that today we will bring those things before you. An attitude, a habit. Lord, I know that we all know if you're pointing something out in our lives right now. And I pray, Lord, we'd take and deal with those things, God, and bring them before your cross, Lord, and receive, God, forgiveness because we have confessed and repented them before you, and then allow you, God, just to work your perfect work. And Father, we also pray today, as we always do, Lord, if you've brought any here today who have never made a personal and public commitment to receive you, Jesus, as their Lord and Savior, to know, God, that the grace of forgiveness is available to them right now today if they will acknowledge the fact that they need a Savior, that they are a sinner who needs a Savior. If you have never come into that personal and living relationship with God today through faith in Jesus Christ, is He knocking upon the door of your heart? Is He calling out to you today? He loves you. I know He's calling out to you today. If you are here and you've never made that personal commitment to Him, He went to Calvary's cross 2,000 years ago for you, personally. But even as He was raised up and came to die for your sin, now He says, will you believe that? Do you believe that? And will you acknowledge that you need to confess your sin and that you need a Savior. And I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. Will you believe in Him today? Will you trust Him today? Will you confess your sin? Will you bring it before Him that He can deal with that? The Bible tells us that He has gone ahead to prepare a place in glory for those that believe in Him and that He is coming again very soon to receive unto Himself those who are His own. Are you His today? Do you want to go to heaven today? How are you going to get to heaven? We've already talked about it's not because of a church denomination. It's not because of good works. It's not because of church ritual. It's because you believe in the name of the Son of God. You have brought your sin before Him to be washed clean by His blood. And you have sought forgiveness for your sin through God's only begotten Son. Will you receive Christ as your personal Lord and Savior today? If you want to receive Him today, can I pray for you? Will you stand right where you're seated today if I can pray for you? Is there anyone at all here today? Anyone at all? that wants to receive Christ, that wants to know their eternal destiny is set today because of their faith in Christ. Don't leave here today without knowing Him. Don't leave here today without taking that step of faith. Is there anyone at all, anyone at all that we can pray for? Anyone. Anyone at all. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see, Lord, if there's any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Father, I pray that we would see 
by even praying that prayer, Lord, it keeps us very current with you. It keeps us, Lord, very much aware of who you are and what you did and the privilege and the grace that we have in coming, Lord. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Try me. And know my thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. And Father, I pray for each one here today, Lord. I pray, God, for your grace upon their lives. And I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't hold back from you in any way, shape, or form. But God, those things that have been binding us up, even as believers, Father, we can be released from those and set free from those even right now. In Jesus' name, amen.